All right. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Harsh Naik. I'm a member of the Canadian Students for Sensible Drug Policy, Toronto. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight um, for the third session of Imagining a Place Free of T Speaker Series and Political Education Session with Beverly Bain. Um, so for accessibility purposes, um, computer-generated closed captioning is available throughout the event. Um, if you need closed captioning, please click the live stream, live transcript button at the bottom of the screen and select show subtitles. Um, please reach out to any um, of the admin and the co-hosts in the chat if you have any problems or difficulty accessing the service. Um, so Imagining a Place for U of T is, is presented in collaboration with um, the support of many organizations and student groups, including the University of Toronto Graduate Students Union, um, the U of T Scarborough Campus Students Union, the Mississauga Students Union, the U of T Students Union, um, U of T Law Union, um, Toronto Princess Rights Project, and many, many more, which will share their names in the chat. Um, so CSSTP Toronto is a grassroots network of students and community members based at the University of Toronto, um, committed to abolition, decriminalization, um, harm reduction, public health, and social justice. Um, CSSTP Toronto is part of a larger network, uh, Fosteral Island, fighting to end the war on drugs from a policy and policing perspective. Um, through direct action um, and education, we advocate for the decriminalization and legalization of all drugs, um, police and prison abolition, decolonization, mad disability justice, um, Indigenous, Black, queer, trans, and sex worker liberation, and other related social justice and health equity issues. Um, and before we begin, I just wanna make a quick, uh, a, a brief land acknowledgement. Um, I encourage everyone here to share in the chat where you're joining us um, today from and to reflect on the native land that you're situated on and to explore your own social context to that land. Um, so as a settler on these lands, I reflect on their history and recognize the over 200 year genocide that continues to this day uh, and has allowed settlers like me to reap the benefits of colonization of indigenous land across the island. Um, so I'm in Tuckeronto, Treaty 13 territory or colonially referred to as Toronto. Um, these lands and waterways have known human activity for thousands of years and are the territories of the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the Credit, um, the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Seneca, Métis, and many other indigenous peoples and nations. As part of the dish with one spoon wampum, uh, this land was subject to an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to mutually care for the land and the creatures they share it with. Subsequent Europeans and settlers were invited into this covenant in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. However, as we all know, this was not upheld as European colonizers and the ongoing settler state project of so-called Canada has and continues to break these agreements in the name of genocide, heteropatriarchy, capitalism, and imperialism. From police brutality and or policing of black communities to the RCMP invading sovereign Wet'suwet'en territory over the illegal coastal gasoline pipeline, Canada is a project of white supremacy, anti-blackness, and racial colonial power. As a settler, it's important for me to not only understand the harms that I'm causing, both intentionally and unintentionally, but also to ensure that I do my part in abolitionist and decolonization movements. Helping organize um, to abolish police and policing mentality at the University of Toronto is one local way. Um, to, today, March 21st, is the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. On this day in 1960, police in apartheid South Africa killed 69 people and seriously wounded 180 others who were protesting against racist past laws that dictated where Black South Africans were able to move and live. Remembering this history, it's important for us to reflect on the words and actions of internationalists such as Karl Marx, Marcus Garvey, Che Guevara, and others in recognizing the solidarity um, between struggles of all oppressed people across the world. Um, Black, Indigenous, racialized, queer, poor, non-Christian, migrants and refugees, lower caste, um, mad disabled, um, all of their struggles against white supremacy, uh, ethno-nationalism, fascism, racism, heteropatriarchy, and far-right movements are linked. Policing, state violence, surveillance, mass incarceration, the prison industrial complex, the military industrial complex, uh, imperialism, all these go hand in hand with ongoing settler colonial projects and white supremacy, not only here on Turtle Island, but around the world, in Kashmir, in Palestine, in Tibet, and beyond. Uh, we want to say that we are against the Russian imperialist expansion of, and the invasion of Ukraine. However, we are also against the imperialist expansion and white supremacy logic of NATO. Um, in one breath, Canada condemns the action of, NATO, of Russia and has unwaveringly placed sanctions on Russian products, organizations, and individuals. However, in the same breath, they prom um, Canada um, continues to send supplies and weapons to Saudi Arabia to bomb Yemen. Um, they refuse to uh, condemn or place sanctions on Israel for its other colonial expansions in Palestine and for committing the crime of apartheid as reported by Human Rights Watch, Betsalem and Amnesty International. And ironically, they condemn the occupation of spaces in Ukraine by Russia while um, reporting from Parliament Hill, which is, on, on, which is occupied unceded Algonquin territory. Um, 
So we must be united in our opposition to any form of expansion, um, any form or any uh, expansion of policing, state violence, or military powers. Um, as Ghassan Kenafani said, um, imperialism has laid its body over the world, um, the head in Eastern Asia, the heart in the Middle East, its arteries reaching Africa and Latin America, and wherever you strike it, you damage it, and you serve the world revolution. And so we want to share with you some events, some open letters and actions that are being organized in our mutual struggle for liberation, um, from supporting the Giddington land defenders defending their sovereign land against the coastal, pipe, uh, coastal gas and pipeline in West Whitney Nation, to environmental justice and mercury freedom for grass and arrows First Nations, to ending the criminalization of poverty. Um, these resources and, and events being shown on the screen now uh, will also be shared by members of our team in the chat and please uh, get involved um, as much as you can in, in mutual struggle for liberation for all oppressed people. Um, we're also here today as part of the Scholar Strike Canada Teachings and Day of Action that began today and will run until March, uh, March 23rd um, where there will be a Day of Action across uh, Toronto. Um, and there will be many conversations around internationalism and global abolition movements. Um, so be sure to check out all the teachings that you can. Um, and you can find it on their website at scholarstrikecanada.ca. Um, and they also have a solidarity statement, which I encourage everyone to read and sign on to. Um, so in terms of this movement, the goal of this speaker series um, was to be the first of many steps and actions to organize and mobilize students to develop a safer police-free campus community. In doing so, we hope to create a network of students, faculty, community members, and organizations who are interested in working towards a police-free UFT campus. Um, we, have already, we already have over 22 student groups um, and community organizations, and our coalition has about 40 students um, and is continuing to grow. So if you would like to jo and join this growing coalition, please email us at uh, the email that will be shared in the chat. Um, so in the first two sessions of the Imagining a Police Free UFT series, we had Dr. Ronaldo Walcott um, critically discuss the history and origins of policing. And then we had a, a powerful discussion with Desmond Cole and Mamuna Muhammad on the impacts of campus police on student safety. Um, tonight, we will be discussing what organizing for a police free world looks like and outline actionable ways for students to organize on campus to abolish police and the mentality of policing ingrained in, in institutions such as U of T. Um, so we'll engage in a conversation um, with the speaker and then we'll, we'll throughout, the, uh, throughout the time, we'll have it open for any questions that the audience has for our speaker. Um, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to submit any questions. Um, you can also um, share them in the chat or you can also raise your hand and ask your questions verbally um, and we'll unmute you to do so. Um, please also feel free to engage in the conversation today on social media using the hashtag um, police for UFT. Uh, the session will also be recorded and shared on our Facebook page after the event. Um, now, after, without further ado, it's my honor to introduce our speaker for tonight's session. Um, Beverly Bain is a black queer, radical feminist, anti-capitalist scholar, um, public intellectual and organizer. She teaches on feminism, blackness, queer diaspora, radical pedagogies, anti-violence, anti-racism, and decolonialism in women and gender studies in the Department of Historical Studies at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. She frequently delivers lectures on gender, anti-blackness, sexuality, abolition, and liberation nationally and internationally. She's interviewed regularly in the media on black feminism, queer organizing, and on police, policing and abolition. She's published in numerous books and journals, including Queerly Canadian Second Edition, We Still Demand Redefining Resistance in Sex and Gender Struggles, Canadian Women's Studies, Fireweed and the conversation. Um, please join me in welcoming Beverly Bain. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And thanks for your amazing land acknowledgement and, um, uh, and for um, recognizing the work of Scholars Strike Canada and the teachings and protests that will take place on Wednesday. So thank you so much for welcoming me. And, um, and uh, I just want to reach out and say hi to those who, are, who have joined us. Welcome and thank you for joining. Um, I want to start by offering um, uh, what I call a um, collective, uh, an audio collective transmission piece that was done by students from my uh, WGS 365 who um, decided to do their project on um, uh, uh, campus um, policing and the impact for um, racialized indigenous, uh, you know, um, and black um, uh, women and others on campus. And what that actually the impact and why it is important for us to have a free 
um, uh, police youth team. Um, so I'll start by playing that audio transmission and then um, Harsh and I would engage, <laughs> right? Yep. Okay, so I'll do that now. Um, Sorry, but Ms. Uh, you, were you able to share the sound? I'm sorry, can you hear it? No, I don't think so. Oh no. I think you have to reshare and then click the share sound at the bottom of the that screen. I, I, did, I did do that. Oh. So I'm not sure why it's not why it's not picking it up. Um sorry. Um let me try this then. Maybe maybe I need to go back to um, Oh yeah, we can hear it now. I think it was going let's to... travel back in time to 18th century Barbados. You can just start again. I can did every aspect again. of life in the colony. Here the fit loom, 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 loom large. Give me one Policing minute. the mobility. One minute, please. Ooh. I'm trying to. I'm having trouble starting it again. Let me just stop sharing and try it and start again. So, um, hmm. I'm having some real trouble sharing, um, starting it again. Uh, it did every yeah, aspect yeah. of life in the colony. It did every, it, 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 it did every aspect of life. In the did you want to just? Let's travel back to time to 18th century Barbados, where slave codes dictated every aspect of life in the colony. Here, the figure of the night watchman loomed large, policing the mobility of enslaved Black people on and off plantations. But what does a tiny island in the Caribbean Sea have to do with campus police at U of T? The logics behind racial capitalism and the profits from slavery created the very foundations of North America. Policing as we know it today is steeped in the discipline and punishment of enslaved black people, indigenous people, and any other people the colonizers deemed were not white. The fact that these same groups of people are the primary targets of modern policing is not a coincidence. And U of T campus police is no different the university does not exist outside of the state despite its attempts to rebrand campus police to campus safety. Though the workings of carcerality extend far beyond campus police and into every facet of the institution, from diversity offices to the architecture of the university itself, campus police represent one of the more visible arms of the state. So again, who are the campus police? A report published by the University of Toronto Students Union in March 2021 reveals the close working relationship between the U of T campus police, the Toronto Police, and Peel Police Services, which disproportionately targets BIPOC, disabled, low income, and queer communities. Campus police are sworn in by Toronto Peel Police and work directly for them. A brief look at the section on campus police training should make clear that the safety of these groups is not a priority. There is no mandatory equity, anti-racism, or bias training offered according to the most recent campus police reports. In 2016, only 11 campus police attended optional training in scenario-based mental health. Three years later, a UTM student seeking mental health support was handcuffed by campus police. They told me to stand up and turn around. In that moment, I started to panic, the student said. I had no mental health professional with me to tell me what's happening. The same lack of training applies to LGBTQ issues as well. This became painfully evident when in 2017, the U of T free speech rally resulted in campus police aggression against transgender and black students at the rally. 
That same year, only one member of the campus police staff went to a training on Islamophobia on university campuses. This is deeply concerning considering the widespread surveillance and intimidation of Muslim students by police officers on university campuses pre and post 9-11. In the past few years, executives of the Muslim Students Association at U of T have received surprise visits from the RCMP and the Canadian Security Intelligence Service at their student offices and even their own homes. So what does this mean in terms of meeting the needs of the community? Do campus police really make students feel safe? The evidence suggests otherwise. We believe that abolitionist futures are possible, necessary, and already being made. It's clear that having cops on campus is actively harmful to the well-being of students at U of T. Policing cannot be unmoored from its roots in slavery and colonization, and so another system must replace it. President Gertler, we are speaking directly to you. We call for an immediate divestment from campus policing and reallocation of funds towards resources that will actually meet students' needs. Most of the calls to campus police do not warrant police action. Students in mental distress should be connected with a trained, culturally appropriate practitioner instead of an agent of a violent institution that has been known to handcuff students in crisis and disproportionately criminalize racialized, queer, and disabled people. We demand accountability. Anyone working to ensure the safety of students should be subject to ongoing performance reviews by a transparent external body guided by the desires of students. Students should always know their rights on campus and be equipped to exercise them. At the same time, we know that anything short of abolition will reproduce the power structures that produced policing in the first place. So in the future, we imagine a university where the community's needs are met through a network of care and support that is specific to age, gender, race, class, ability, and so much more. Community support staff should be trained in de-escalation and crisis intervention tactics that are backed with trauma-informed knowledge. This would allow for crisis response on campus to happen through harm reduction focused on student well-being rather than the protection of private property and the policing of public space. We want a concerted effort by the university to invest in resources for students who are experiencing houselessness, financial distress, addiction, domestic violence, and any other issues that countless students face on a daily basis. Fundamentally, we believe that students must be asked what will make them feel safe on campus and that the institution must honor that and act on it. For us, safety on campus means a place where I feel welcome and encouraged to be myself regardless of my background and beliefs. When my peers and I feel welcomed and not judged by our appearances. I'd like a place that emphasizes student life at night. A community created by our institution that makes the students feel safe enough to freely be who they are. Safety on campus means abolition. Sorry. <laughs> okay, stop sharing. That's the end. It's a six minute um, uh, uh, audio um, uh, um, uh, collective um, um, uh, uh, piece that um, uh, my students did. Um, uh, several of them, uh, they all did audio pieces. I played this one because this one was focused on cops off campus or a free, uh, uh, um, a cop free U of T. And I, this is why I played it uh, specifically for this particular session. And the reason why I did it too is because I think it's important for us to hear students' voices. I mean, we're talking about campus. We're talking about the university and the institution where students are sort of the, you know, um, you know, th that constitute this environment. And, um, you know, um, I teach at UTM, um, which actually, um, you know, um, primarily, you know, are uh, made up of racialized, you know, mm. Middle Eastern, um, South Asian, Asians and black students. Right. I mean, I look around my classroom and my classroom, my students are primarily all racialized. And uh, and when I remember very clearly when this issue of cops on campus came up, it was in the context of, a, of several students being handcuffed when they went to uh, 
you know, the um, health and wellness center for support because they were in crisis of some kind, um, emotional, and, and, and actually was told that the police, the campus police had to be called. Mm -hmm. And in cases where that happened, um, they were handcuffed. And uh, of course, what happened in those instances is that uh, students, th the situation felt as though it escalated from care to one of criminalization. And students, um, and they were put in a cruiser and taken to, and they were told that they were being, you know, um, basically um, arrested, right? That they, and, and they were put in a cruiser and taken to the hospital. So this situation did not feel in any way and that uh, as, as a safety measure or as a protective measure, but one that extended beyond the institution. And then there were situations in, in the situation of, 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 of black, um, of a black um, uh, woman uh, on campus, a student who actually wanted to know why she was being put in handcuff if she went for support because she was um, experiencing some emotional distress. And when she questioned because of her size as a black woman, because she was tall, because she was gender non-conforming in appearance, the Peel police was called in by the campus police, right? And she was arrested by the Peel police and actually um, positioned as um, endangering the life of police, right? This is a student, a black student, a black young woman who's there uh, because, you know, she's in the institution to get an education. And what happens is that she's now, you know, um, within an institution that is an institution of criminality that actually criminalizes her, that before she can even um, finish her degree, she can possibly end up with a criminal record because she was seeking support. Or she could end up being killed, uh, being seen as violent and aggressive because of her size, because of her blackness, because of her parents, because of her non-gender conforming um, body, and actually be killed in that process. So there were those kinds of situations that were happening um, in, in 20, um, 17, 2018, um, and um, uh, students were actually um, creating opportunities for them to start talking about, you know, a mental health crisis. And it was at UTM where students um, who were primarily racialized, who were actually, um, um, who experienced these situations that decided that they wanted to do a campaign, a campaign to actually um, call um, on the institution to stop this practice and to stop you know, the practice of police, of campus police intervention in situation of this, of, of this sort. I'll stop there so we can continue. I, and I, I, I want to give you this sort of overall picture uh, because students came to me and we together with other professors started and students started this campaign. And, um, uh, and I wanted to make sure that students' voices are not lost in this conversation. And also to say that while everybody, all students are not asking necessarily for the same thing, there are students who are actually um, asking for the removal of campus police, of police on campus, and are seeking uh, you know, a non-carceral um, way of operating within the institution. Yeah, thank you for sharing that um, that audio. And, and I have a lot of questions now of what you said, so I'll, I'll try and pick one. Um, but yeah, I think I think for me it was really, and I'm sure for many people listening, it was, it was refreshing to hear students um, engaging in abolition talk in the institution. I don't think you hear it often, um, especially as an assignment. I don't think I've ever heard that. Um, being done at U of T before. So I, that was very like promising for me to see that there is this conversation happening and, and students are engaging. I, I think like my first question was what what was like the response from students when you brought up these topics of abolition or, or you know, removing cops off campus? Like was there, 
I'm sure there was confusion, but what like is how did you get to navigate that that space with the students? Well, um, the course that I where this is um, happening um, is in my WGS three six five, which is uh, which is titled Gender Justice and the Law. I am teaching. The, I'm not teaching this course as a as a way to have students um, look, you know, um, work with the, the legal framework as it exists. I'm not a lawyer. So I'm teaching it from a position of, of um, um, interrogating and unmasking and um, um, uh, ref a refusal to the kind of um, uh, legal frameworks and logics that exist. Right, because I'm teaching it from the framework that says the, these particular uh, legal frameworks were designed right from the beginning, right, um, as a way to undermine the livability of Black and Indigenous lives. And you had um, Ronaldo Walcott on your program, and he talked about the rise of prisons and where that came from. Um, you know, Simone Brown tells us where prisons, you know, and the idea of the kinds of prisons that exist today, right? The, 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 the type of prisons that exist today of dehumanization and the destruction of the human was conceptualized within the context of slavery, right? And continued to be perpetuated, right? Throughout time, right? Prison became a uh, you know, um, a site of entrapping, you know, black bodies in particular uh, throughout decades. And in modern history, it became a site, you know, for, the, for, for uh, bodies that were also racialized, you know, in a particular way that was a, allowed to be criminalized and allowed to be considered um, disposable. Does black bodies, does indigenous bodies. I mean, if we think about the way, you know, um, what has happened post 9-11 and the way that Muslims who were, um, you know, uh, held, but they were held outside what we would call the, you know, um, a state of exception to use uh, a gambon, right? They were. They, they, they will out they, where no where they cannot be humanized not that prison humanize you but you're not even allowed to be for anyone you're not you don't exist as far as that is concerned right so you have Abu Ghraib you have Guantanamo these sites were sites of the of disappearance right where no um, of any kind of human rights jurisdiction of anything that exists in, in some form of parameters would actually be able, right, to um, uh, uh, in any way find or, or see or be able to, um, you know, um, um, uh, see these bodies and these individuals in these spaces as actually livable bodies and spaces. They were there to die, to disappear, right? And to go through a period of a long durée of dying and death, <laughs> right? Right? So we know that these kinds of carceral institutions are set up, right? Uh, for bodies that are meant to destroy and to dehumanize these bodies. So the reality of the matter is, is that when we look at the statistics in this country, those who make up the majority of, of people who are in these institutions are primarily indigenous and black people, right? We also have Muslims held under the 9-11, you know, um, law, right? Um, but black and indigenous people are the ones who make up the majority and are they in comparison, you know, um, the, small, the smaller populations. So we have to ask the question, why is that? And what does that say about prisons and other forms of carcerality? Is that it's understood 
as 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 elements that are meant to dehumanize and to destroy particular bodies and particular lives and to render those lives you know um unlivable right in what so there is no possibility of speaking to the reformation of these kinds of institutions right because mm -hmm. these institutions, no matter how you reform, and we know that people have been talking about, people have been talking all kinds of reforms uh, for decades, no matter how you institute forms of reforms, these reforms does not destroy the fundamental element of what prisons and policing is all about and who they are designed to, um, to prey upon and to destroy. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know who said it, but the quote comes to mind where like, you can't, you can't use the tools of the oppressor to liberate yourself. So there's no, I, I agree, like, there's no, at least in my opinion, I know I speak to a lot of people who, who believe that reformist, sorry, uh, reformist reforms can lead to change, but I, I personally don't see how using the current system of jails and prisons and stuff can, and, and having changes there can lead to any kind of liberation. Um, and I also remember reading that the current system of prisoning and policing that we're seeing, that we see commonly in on Turtle Island is, was spread throughout the world through colonization to other regions like Africa, South Asia, and Latin America, like the prison systems that they have set up there were brought there by colonizers. And now it's, it's just the way that it's done there too. But prior to colonization, like forms of justice weren't prisons and, and jails in those areas. So um, yeah, it's, that, it's Definitely, the roots of prison replacing, as you said, trace back to slavery and, and um, the developments there. Um, I, I wanted to ask about. I mean, you mentioned um, uh, like the the actions that your students took after the arrest um, of students on campus, and I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember I I know you also authored or helped author a commentary in the varsity, um, the U of T student newspaper, in response to like. I'm not sure if, it is, if it, is this the instance you're speaking of or another instance but of, a, of a racialized student being um, arrested on campus after experiencing a mental health crisis and you know, a call to action and a list of demands that you and other um, you know, profs and, and um, students put together. Um, I just wanted to, I was wondering if you could uh, speak to this letter and, and you know, what the university's response was, any actions that followed up from this letter or, or, this, or, this, or this sort? Um, well, <laughs> um, when, when we uh, actually um, forwarded that letter to the administrators across the three campuses, we got no response from anyone. Then um, someone fired off a bureaucratic letter from Simcoe Hall. Um, it was one of the vice um, provosts, um, fired off a letter to us, basically saying that they are doing a review of, and the focus was on you know, um, the Mental Health Act. Uh, um, the mental health practices on campus, I should say, in conjunction with, um, you know, um, uh, in conjunction with um, um, uh, um, uh, Canadian Mental Health Association and their protocol, and um, uh, to make sure that they are following all, you know, all of the processes that they and and uh, that they are supposed to be following, and of course that as you well know, review was forced upon them because at first they resisted that there was a crisis that they were um, uh, perpetuating on campus. Uh, you know, students had committed suicide. There were several situations of suicide at the downtown <laughs> campus. Um, and, and the only time when they acknowledged that this is something that they needed to pay attention to um, was when, you know, one student uh, da, um, uh, uh, actually jumped from one of the buildings, um, the university buildings. Uh, so this became much more of a, you know, um, liability issue for the, the institution than it was about the fact that, look, there is an issue here on campus that students are experiencing and that your approach to it is not working. Yes, calling in the campus police because you're not able to provide enough support um, services is not appropriate. Mm -hmm. And calling in the campus police because, you know, um, a student comes 
to um, uh, a counsel and say, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm having, I'm in distress is not working either because no one is going to come to you if they know that that is what is going to happen to them. So then you are actually setting them up even more for, um, um, uh, um, you know, uh, for a situation where they will not seek support, right? So that is, um, so it wasn't until the pressure, you know, that started coming from students, uh, it got picked up in the media, uh, that it became clear that something had to be done. However, uh, the place that they began was with in the context of the mental health um, um, protocol mm -hmm. and how best to address that in terms of what needed to happen, what services needed to be provided, um, whether more services needed to be provided. Um, but it also became um, a conversation. And if we read, if we read through the recommendations that came out of their um, review on the mental health uh, piece, um, basically it really almost, it, 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 some, it, it it, 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 it's set up in such a way that it makes it seem as though it's the students who's really the problem here and not the institution, right? It is the student who we have to try and fix. It is the students who really are the ones who need fixing, not the institution, not the, you know, not the fact that we have things in place that are actually detrimental to students' lives and livability. It's that we have to fix them, right? And yes, students will ask and they'll say, we need you to help us. We need you to do things in a way that makes our lives better and us safer, right? But at the same time, um, while they're asking for that, they're also not asking to be caught up in a net, you know, of carcerality that, uh, that, that, that actually then scapegoats or then, um, you know, somehow, you know, um, um, targets them in ways that are not appropriate, right? Um, so uh, the first set of recommendations that they did, the first uh, study did not speak to uh, police on campus. In fact, I met with our, our um, you know, vice president at the time and said, you know, um, we have to talk about police, campus police, and please don't tell me about training. Do not tell me about better, you know, protocols for um, the police because that is not working. We know that these things don't work, right? It is not about that. They are, they are actually ensconced in a, you know, um, a policing services act that is about criminalization, that is about detaining people and arresting people. So it doesn't matter what the conditions are, what the circumstances are, once they come to you, they are detaining you or arresting you. And that in itself is criminalization. It's the same thing we say, why are police being called to situations where people are in mental health crisis? What has happened? What have we witnessed over the past you know, years? What has led to 2020 and the reckoning and the uprising? A lot of that had to do with the way that police, when they come into situations, these individuals end up dead and they happen to be black and brown, primarily and indigenous. What we witness here in Canada, in this country, is that between 2020 and now, several um, uh, uh, Black and Indigenous people and Brown people have been killed by the police when the police were called because someone was in mental health distress. And they were killed in a matter of five minutes, five seconds, and you kind of wonder, whoo! But then we look at what has happened, you know, recently with the convoy protest, mm. right? And we saw how they were handled with kid gloves. Now, this is not a call for police intervention. In fact, I'm an abolitionist, 
right? We are not caught, we didn't, we are not calling for police intervention. We're just drawing the parallels as to how they were handled as people whose lives mattered, who came there with their children so they could not be dangerous and therefore they had to be cared for and protected and looked after, right? And the difference between when they arrive at the home of a black or indigenous person who's in distress, who may be waving a pen knife or uh, some instrument, we know that there were weapons that were the, the convoy, many of the convoy protesters had. In addition to that, they were waving fascist and racist and Islamophobic, um, 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 you know, um, various kinds of paranalia, and they were actually making comments and, and, and harassing people as they went by. We know all of that, yet those people, you know, pretty much did not find themselves um, seriously hurt or harmed in any way, you know, as we often see happens to people who are black and brown when police come in into these situations. So we have been saying, we do not want police being the ones who engage with people in mental health crisis. Why would we want that on our campus? Why would we want that for our students who are there to learn, right? Who are there to be safe, not to be, you know, not, not to end up in a situation where their lives are actually imperiled because of institutional, um, you know, um, um, uh, carceral um, 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 systems and practices. That's not what that is supposed to do. Yeah, I, I would, again, a lot of, a lot of things to, to unpack there. And I would even kind of extend the, the more explicit forms of campus policing to policing policies and, and the practices that the uh, institution implements. And I know there's one movement going on at the UT Law Union where they're, they're trying to fight the UMLAP, UMLAP uh, policy of mandatory leave. Um, so I encourage folks to check out UT Law Union's social medias, but they're trying to fight that policy, which for students who are experiencing a mental health problem or, or any kind of you know distress where they need to take time off, they're physically un not allowed to return to campus because they're seen as a threat. Um, exactly. And, yeah. exactly, exactly, exactly. So there, so therein lies the problem. And if we remember, I know one of the things they were saying that they were working on, and I'm thinking, uh, trying to resolve some of the dynamics and tensions that has happened is that when the con when they were um, th when they blockade uh, Queens Park, there was an overflow of. Uh, Toronto Police Services people who overflowed into the University of Toronto and together the campus police and the Toronto Police Services actually worked together, right, at that site. So that students who were coming in, many of them were actually far more um, terrified by the presence of campus and you know, Toronto Police Services who have amalgamated together uh, to say that they were protecting people who were coming into the university, right? And I'm thinking, wow, right? I'm thinking, how does that work? How can you tell, how can you say that this is protecting us, right? We've just, um, in fact, um, this morning in the first session, on the, the rise of the ultra-right and ethno-nationalism, racism, um, et cetera. Um, Courtney Skye, one of um, the panelists, uh, showed us a clip that actually, um, that stated that now the, 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 the government is going to maintain particular um, um, uh, policies in place that will actually, um, uh, um, make illegal and seen as threatening blockades. That would be extended to, now we know that that would definitely means indigenous blockades, mm -hmm. but that is already under threat. Mm -hmm. But I think there'll be a larger extension. It would also be extending to protests are considered blockades. When you take up the street 
as we have seen last year with the parks and, and, those, and, 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 and those in the encampment, we saw how they were um, attacked by police. How, many, how much police was, was, was um, deployed? How many security was deployed to, um, in, into parks where there were like 10 encampments, 10 people in an encampment, mm -hmm. right? And, and of course, people going there to support them and provide them with various forms of, of care and support and how the attacks and the vicious attacks against people who are under house, who are out, who are unhoused, who are poor, who are racialized, who are indigenous, right? Um, in these spaces. And we know for a fact that the police continue to occupy the city, downtown core, right? This, what we have recognized is that the convoy protest itself has actually allowed, right? For what has already been instituted, you know, as the the the, the deployment, the the um, escalation of deployment of policing and militarization to actually um, unfold in ways that you know that is hard to um, contain or to say, well, whoa, and it's such a contradictory to what was called for in 2020, which was defund, demilitarize, and abolish. In fact, what we have seen in the last three years is the escalation the, uh, and, and the exceptional funding to all police services across this country and increased militarization. So now our public spaces are spaces where we no longer can actually, um, you know, see as spaces where we can walk safely without encountering, you know, police and various kinds of policing personnel. Yeah, well, again, a lot, to, a lot to unpack there. And, and um, I think the Toronto Police Service has recently approved an uh, increase in their, but or uh, the budget um, for Toronto Police um, for twenty twenty. To, I think, um, even though, like you said, there has been calls by a lot of on the ground movements like Black Lives Matter and, and no, uh, another, not another Black Life, no Prime Policing, of at least a 50% reduction in the police budget. But I do believe that there was an, an approved increase for this upcoming year, which is um, there was. Complete, yeah, there was the opposite of what, what we've been asking was. for. Yeah, there was. Yeah. And th that was passed. Yeah. And, 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 in, uh, and I mean, the body cams alone was also an increase. Mm -hmm. The body cams are $6 million a year. Uh, five years, uh, that's like $35 million or $30 million. And, um, and, and in addition to that is that they are deploying what they call, you know, um, mental health, um, a, 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 a pilot project mm -hmm. that will cost another you know, um, um, several million dollars. The, all of the things that we are at saying we do not want, they are going ahead and deploying that as a way to um, um, provide more funding to the police at, um, at the, you know, in various ways. I mean, I could, I could talk about that forever. I just want to kind of bring it back to campus and, and what students can, can do. And I, someone had a question in, in Submitted to the Q and A. I encourage people to continue asking questions in the Q and A in the chat. But someone had asked, "What can TAs, um, course instructors, faculty, etc., do to support students who are in mental health crises, um, and to kind of relieve, the, to kind of not expose them to campus police and carcerality? Um, are there resources or spaces available that we can recommend to students in crises that don't rely on these carceral systems?" Yeah, um, and I think one of the things that we are, you know, um, I mean. There are community health programs, right, that exist that we, that, um, you know, as opposed to, um, you know, um, the more elaborate, more institutional type. But going back to the campus, I mean, the wellness centers are supposed to have, I mean, that's the kind of support students should have on campus, right? Um, you know, um, therapists and others, um, but it, they must remove that protocol that of calling police if a person 
is in crisis. Mm -hmm. In fact, what we have been calling for is the establishment, you know, of, you know, teams across the, across campus where, you know, we bring in community health, um, um, uh, um, uh, community health um, professionals who can train some of us on campus, students, uh, those who are faculty are in, uh, and interested, um, our mental health, our health team to actually do these kinds of intervention in situations where students feel that they are not on. on. I'm muted, so no need to worry. Where they are experiencing. Oh, okay. Are you okay? And sorry, I'm, I have to stay on and monitor. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I think there's someone unmuted. Um, and I think that's what we're advocating for. That team, specialist teams are created that are actually not institutional, right? that mm -hmm. are able to provide and intervene in these support system that has a, uh, you know, a mutual aid approach, you know, mm -hmm. you know, one that actually is about care, but care in a mutual aid, um, radical sense mm -hmm. that actually puts the in, puts the, the person well being first, not the institutional um, um, protection and uh, and and it's uh, and it's um it's um it's 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 property <laughs> first, but put the individual first, right? Where that that's the kind of you know um um uh, 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 teams we are talking about, and that's possible, mm -hmm. right? It is possible. I mean. Campuses like Guelph have already said no police should be on campus, period. And that mm. should be substituted for, you know, other kinds of, you know, um, interventions that are, uh, that are, that are more community-based. Mm -hmm. So why are we giving our money to, to Canadian Mental Health Association? Why is this institution giving the money to Canadian Mental Health Association calling in psychiatrists and other, you know, therapists at the, who are also very quite invested in medicalization, mm -hmm. as opposed to you know community um, 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 uh, 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 community um, uh, services and community uh, support, you know uh, indigenous communities does a lot of this work. Why aren't we creating these kinds of connections with these communities? Black communities do a lot of mutual aid and community support. Why? Are, isn't our institution making those kinds of connections, right? We have other um, services run by racialized communities that offer this kind of support. Why aren't we making um, connection with that? Not having a person from an agency represent, but they should be the primary uh, people we are investing in, in terms of helping us to, ref to do this work, right? And our students obviously at the center of this. Yeah, I just want to share like one one story that we heard from in our session with Desmond Cole that um, there was one college. I don't want to name the college. I don't want to get them in trouble. But there was one college on campus, one residence that they, I guess, the dons and the residence ambassadors there decided that they would not call campus police for any kind of um, mental health crisis or, or any any instances that they came across that they would they would train themselves to handle it themselves. And I think, like I said, you know, it's, it's going to take that mutual aid building and like, you know, starting from the ground up these small initiatives and, and having them grow across campus. Or I know Desmond Cole talking about in his neighborhood, um, they, they've mutually agreed not to call police to, for any mental health crisis or any, real, you know, really anything in general. And it really starts with local movements that kind of will build, like I said, in a mutual aid kind of fashion. And that is the, and that is the, um, the principle of, those who engage in abolition work, mm -hmm. right? The principle of those who engage in abolition work is that we don't call police for um, in, in these situations. We don't call police to intervene, to intervene in crises of black and brown and racialized people. We don't, we don't, we don't do that because, <laughs> I, mean, we, I mean, we have so much evidence. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do we want? <laughs> to show what's happening. Let's look at the schools. Let's move from our university to just, um, you know, um, 
uh, to secondary and, and primary uh, and uh, public schools here in this country. Little children, they're calling in the police for. Mm -hmm. Now you tell me, a six-year-old, what? how dangerous can a six-year-old child be that it, that child requires being handcuffed? It's happened in Mississauga, where a six-year-old, a kindergarten child, was handcuffed by police. Then we have another situation where a kid, another black child, another young child, 10 years old, was thrown against the wall by police. Like, I mean, what could that, what could that child have done to deserve that kind of treatment? Which in itself is an indication that we, even as we are considered dangerous from the time we were born. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, six year old, you're dangerous. You should go, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you can only be handled by through criminalization. That's the, you know, the prison to pipeline, right? Which is why we say the school is a prison to pipeline for black people in particular and for other racialized people and for indigenous people. Because it's within that institution, they first experience incarceration mm -hmm. within the context of the education system is where they, they experience being incarcerated for the very first time. And to think of that, just to fathom that alone is a terrifying idea, right? That you send your child to school and where they understand prison and, and incarceration is within the school system, right? And that is, and that travels all the way up to, you know, higher education, mm -hmm. where we see that within the, the higher the, the um, higher education institutions are even far more sophisticated within these kinds of ways in which they function and operate. They're, they're actually netted in particular kinds of ways across the globe, not just, you know, within uh, the country, but across the globe, because we're talking about technology, right? We're talking about universities and programs that actually train people to surveil each other. I mean, we have, I mean, that's, UFT has that program mm -hmm. of surveillance, where it trains people uh, to, to surveil, how you surveil people, how you keep watch on other people. Mm -hmm. So we are the site of casserality in so many different ways that we, that we have our own classmates who become a threat to us. Mm -hmm. I had an in, a, a, a situation where I um, um, was sitting on the bus coming, um, you know, I take the, um, uh, the school bus, you know, from downtown to UTM. And there was this student who was sitting next to me and this, and someone was parked um, in an incorrect spot that blocked the bus. And that person immediately went into overdrive of surveilling and calling the police and dialing the number. And, and I'm thinking like, wow, you need to calm down. That is not your job. You don't even know what the circumstances of this. And then he, he tells me, well, he is in one of UFT's program that actually trains them to, um, to be responsive in that way. And I think, I thought like, wow, you know, these are the ways in which our institutions are carceral. So apart from training our students to be, um, you know, to develop, links with police and policing, we are training them to develop links with, you know, um, with um, technology that actually moves beyond borders and globally that actually ties people in that goes as far as, you know, um, you know, you know, that ensnares people, um, uh, you know, within a whole larger context that endangers them. Yeah, I have a question to follow up with that, but I just want to answer someone's question in the QA quickly. It's a quick question. So, someone has asked when yeah. protesting, when hosting protests, rallies, marches on campus, students don't want to rely on campus security or police for safety concerns. What are some alternatives? Um, are there any initiatives? So, 
So if you, I mean, I don't know, um, Beverly, you also want to add, but I, I'm, I know of many. So if you wanted to reach out to us by email um, at UFTCSD, I think someone can share that our email in the chat, but we can direct you to community-led um, kind of responses that we've organized that provide marshalling and, and medic support and um, uh, that kind of um, services to student-led organization, any kind of community organizing there is available. So you can email us and we can connect you with that. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. And I, I mean, you answered the question. And I think I was going to say that that's the kind of thing we need to develop. Mm -hmm. if it's already there. I mean, we are we are developing as activists. You know, we are developing that kind of um, situation, right? As activists, you know, um, you know, we are going to be on the streets on Wednesday, the twenty third of March, and we are not informing the police because it's our right to reclaim public space. They have denied us that space during COVID in the most you know, vicious ways possible. And as indigenous, black, brown people, we are taking that space, but we are also working with you know, teams of people who know how to provide um, you know, marshalling uh, and, uh, and, and also forms of other forms of care that can help um, you know, shepherd us through that process in a safe way. We don't need the protection of police because police does not protect us. And I think that has to be made clear. The police protects private property. It protects property. Um, you know, as Rinaldo Walcott would say, you know, we are also as black people constituted as property. How do you hell you expect that you will be part of the protection? You are part of that which becomes disposable, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we are not going to be protected by police. That, that was not what they were designed to do, mm -hmm. right? They protect certain people's property, certain uh, institutional spaces, certain individuals who are white and middle-class and rich and conservative can call on them and expect some care, right? But the rest, but those who are black and racialized and brown and indigenous people can expect that they will be violated when the police uh, uh, appears on the scene. I get, I, that actually brings me to the question I want to ask because I know when we've organized, as we've organized this campaign, we've gotten a lot of pushback from other students who argue that they feel safer with the campus police on campus. And like you said, like, you know, these are often sentiments that are you know, echoed in, in community from, you know, often white or people, folks aspiring to whiteness or upper class privileged um, individuals. Like, could you just like speak to these sentiments and, and what would you say to that? Well, I'll say first of all, is that we have been um, conditioned throughout not to imagine otherwise, right? We have been conditioned in ways not to imagine that we can function without um, you know, an institution that is also violent as you know, an institution to rely on for care, right? We have to start imagining ways of caring and safety that is not about harm. And the way in which police function, the RCMP and other state carceral state institution is not about safety and protection, it's about harm, it's about destruction, right? It's about punishment, it's about cruelty. It is not about safety, it is not about protection. We have to develop, we have to come to terms with the fact that we can no longer sustain our lives and sustain the context in which we live in without reimagining and working towards, you know, a police-free um, environment, that being on the university campuses, as well as, you know, um, in society at large and globally, right? We have to start imagining something very different. I mean, if we only look at what has happened and we take, for instance, the way in which the spread of white ethno-nationalism is taking place. And the way that police and other uh, carceral institutions deal with particular people 
who happen to be white. And we see that when we look at what's happening in terms of the, you know, uh, the invasion of Russia, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, we saw how the, the, the war in Europe was positioned as a war, you know, um, that civilized people should not have to experience because Europe is civilized, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? I mean, after all, it's not Afghanistan, as mm -hmm. one reporter said. I mean, we're not living under a rock, as another reporter said, right? When they were talking, these are civilized people, for God's sake, right? So therefore, we have to have, um, in, we, I mean, it's an exceptional situation for the Ukrainians to be in, according to this kind of reporting around civilization discourse, right? Therefore, we have to uh, be far more empathetic, far more understanding, far more, um, 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 uh, um, you know, um, uh, reciprocal in terms of what we are experiencing, even though this is not the same, even though there's been war in the Middle East that has been uh, imperialist wars and uh, have, have actually been wars that has been um, started by these white imperialist nations that continue to perpetuate itself. And, um, you know, and, and we are, uh, you know, and I am for open door policy. I do, I'm not, I'm not supportive of closed borders. I think borders, I think there should not be any borders. People should be free to move, right? There should not be anything like borders, right? Yet um, we see that borders are closed to certain people who are in distress, who are fleeing wars, like people from the Middle East, Haitians, Latin Americans, you know, they end up mm -hmm. being incarcerated at the border actually, of whichever place mm -hmm. they are right? We see what happened in Ukraine, black and brown, and it's that Asian people with South Asian people were told to walk from Ukraine to Poland, right? In the midst of being bombed. And how exceptional um, the livability and the privileging of white lives are in this context, right? And I think all of this has to be understood within the context of the way in which our university itself participate and continue to perpetuate these kinds of um, narratives of civilization and who we should be um, um, throwing our support to and who we should denying our support to. So people in Palestine who are being bombed every day are not, this is not a war on the people of Palestine, mm -hmm. right? This is not a war. These are not genuine liberators and fighters for freedom as we see um, in the situation mm -hmm. where the Ukrainians are uh, fighting to defend themselves. They are genuine liberators and fighters, but people in Palestine aren't, people in the Middle East aren't, people in Latin America aren't, et cetera, et cetera. So I think those things have to be you know, connected together because they are, they absolutely is what constitute and, 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 and shape, you know, the way we understand um, whose lives matter and whose doesn't. You know, that whole idea of necropolitics, like Agamben, like, um, 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 not Agamben, but, um, um, uh, oh my God, now oh, my brain's failing me. Um, Mem uh, Bembe, thanks Sam. <laughs> Sam Tekel, like Bembe, right, um, um, tells us, right, the way that necropolitics, uh, which means that certain people are produced for death. And it doesn't matter, they're always constituted, particularly black people and brown people are produced at the site of death. I mean, Brazil is a, a clear example, right, of how black people in Brazil are produced to die every day. Right, and we see this um, uh, 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 as, as situation, and we cannot separate that from the way it is all intertwined, you know, um, with and sh and how it continues to strengthen the carceral institutions, and and um, that actually continues to exist. Yeah, that's why, that's why I think the the 
like the notion of internationalism is so important because it, it is, like you said, like important to connect all these different events that are happening. And, and, you know, we can, Canada condemns the invasion of Ukraine, but at simultaneously invades sovereign land here in Canada, the West West nation on the West Coast. So it's, it's definitely, it's very important to, to think about that. And I just want to add my own thoughts. So that's okay. I know I'm supposed to be moderating, but I did have some thoughts I wanted to share. And, no, please, um, like, please, yes. <laughs> we, we, just, we just receive this question in comments so often. <laughs> We, we we receive this question and comment like so often of, of, of you know what like you know the police protect us like what do we do if there's a police who's going to keep us safe um and I, for me like i just i just really think like asking the students a question back a question back asking them you know what why do you feel safe with police like what about them makes you feel safe and as you know as you mentioned it, it, when you were speaking like you know is it the person is it your race is it your positionality you know your intersectionality your class position in society that makes you feel comfortable with having police around because you are confident that they won't harass you. Um, and if you are confident in that, are you then saying it's okay for police to, har to harass those who are not like you or who don't, who don't share the same privileges as you? Um, exactly. Another question I wanna ask is what, what do police actually protect us from? Like, do they, do they prevent crime? Um, because if we think about it, police are usually only called after a crime occurs. So there's no real prevention. It's mostly a reaction and it's often a violent reaction. Um, so, you know, I, I wanna like, there's all these certain situations that students, there's, there's common situations that I can think of that students would call police for, for example, like, you know, reporting someone suspicious on campus, but who is often seen as suspicious or, you know, not being worthy of being on campus? Is it someone who's racialized, someone who may look homeless, um, yeah. someone who, you know, appears yeah. to be in mental distress? Would it be to maybe report a robbery or a theft? Um, and, you know, well, you are, you, you might be reporting Robbie or Steph, but like, you know, I, I want to kind of challenge that and say like, are you not going to question the conditions that lead people to steal in the first place? Are, are, are you know, our society is all, always very quick to normalize, you know, violence conducted by the state, especially when it comes to criminalizing poverty, as you know, as you mentioned with the removal of the encampments in Toronto. Um, but I think it was, I think it was Kwame Turi, you know, he said that, you know, is it not violent for a child or anyone in that matter to go to bed hungry in one of the richest countries in the world? Um, but, you know, that, that violence is so often institutionalized that it becomes kind of like normal for us and, and we accept it as being normal. Um, but, you know, why should we accept a society where people are sleeping in the streets in minus 25 degrees or, you know, their lives are kind of up to the mercy of, you know, good Samaritans who let them sleep inside TTC buses when it's that cold at night. Um, and, you know, there's also the notion of you know, reporting sexual assaults or, or rapes on campus. Um, How like if you I know Miriam Kaba has done a lot of research. At the, she's like an activist in Chicago, for those who might not know, but she reports I think uh, I remember reading this recently that about 70% of survivors of rape and sexual assault choose not to go to police. Um, and amazingly, up to a quarter of people who did call the police ended up being arrested themselves, if I remember correctly. So, and I know like there, I know in, in orientation week of 2021, there was a, there was a lot of kind of, there was a lot of talk within students, especially, I didn't really see a lot of media coverage, but there was a lot of talk of, you know, dozens of students coming forward at Western University of you know dozens of sexual assault and and rape um, claims that were going around in August September of 2021, and as far as I know, I don't I haven't seen any response from it from police or or you know them being able to prevent that from happening. Like there there's a known culture of there's a known rape culture at Western University, a known sexual assault culture there. Yet yeah. campus police don't seem to be able to do anything about it. I know like faculty and music at U of T last year there was a demonstration where students demonstrated against um, harassment from professors. Um, again, there was no action being taken then by campus police, nothing was done there. Often in my head, I can, I can imagine police actually supporting or not supporting, but protecting those in power, such as professors. Yeah. Um, and then as you mentioned before, like, you know, the last thing I think of is a police being called to respond to mental health crisis or drug poisoning. And as you've already spoken of, police who are involved in mental health responses often make the situation where often make the fatal outcomes that we often see in the community. And I think it is important that we kind of name some of the folks that have passed away uh, recently. You know, I think, and I apologize, I'm, I'm mispronouncing their names, but I know there's a lot of well in the West Coast, Moses Everly in New York region. Um, there was Regis Christian Skip Paquette, DeAndre Campbell, Clive Mensa, um, Solomon Fakiri in, in prison that, you know, they're still fighting for his justice. There was Ijaz Chodri in Misaga and many, many more that, you know, have passed away as a result of police violence from a mental health response. Um, and I know from personal, from a personal anecdote and things that we're trying to organize in as part of CSSDP in trying to bring more naloxone accessible for students, we've also got, we've, we've run quite a bit of pushback from the, from the, from the institution of trying to make naloxone more accessible. I know one, 
residents ambassador has contacted us that they tried to bring the law and give us all their dons on campus, but they were they were threatened with being fired if they did if they were found to be carrying a lock zone on campus. And currently, police campus police don't carry a lock zone. So, what is their use if they're going to be responding to a student who has overdose or, you know, is, is undergoing a drug poisoning crisis if they're not carrying a lock zone? So, I want to challenge students, you know, who say they feel safer with campus police and, and ask them like why they feel safe and and what does the police actually do in terms of all these instances and just really want to make them reflect on on those kind of sentiments. I absolutely agree. I support. I absolutely support you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just had. To, I just had. Well, I just wanted to get that off my off my oh, chest. That's um, great. That's great, Ash. <laughs> that's um, but I did have a follow up question to to what you had just said, and and it, it is again related to the campaign that we've been building now to abolish campus police, and and it is specifically as I'm sure maybe you know you've experienced in your organizing, but. So often, you know, young, black or racialized women, femme presenting individuals, non-gender conforming individuals are often targeted by people who don't agree with the messaging. And, and we, we experienced that in our team um, from different members of our group who received this, you know, direct messaging on social media, on Twitter and Instagram. And, and I'm not sure in person because of COVID, but I know they received these kind of messages of, you know, backlash, um, targeted comments in, in the commentary. And I was wondering if you had any kind of, you know, advice to, not only like help these students move forward, but even for the protection, because this is probably taking a toll on their mental health and their, and their you know, well-being. And there are students in our group who are facing this and, and we want to find the best way to support them. So if you had any uh, suggestions for that. Uh, um, you're going a bit in and out. So I'm, I'm missing some of what you're saying. Sorry. Um, uh, um, let me see if I, I got what you said. Are you saying that, um, uh, that there is for students um, who are racialized gender non-conforming, you know, um, uh, uh, and on social media, like on Twitter and Facebook and, and, and Instagram. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, so, sorry, let me know. Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, so, I'm, uh, so I, I was saying that there are often, you know, young, Black, or racialized um, women, femme-presenting individuals, non -gen you know, gender non-conforming individuals who are, often who are often part of these movements who are the ones that are targeted by those who don't agree. And they're the ones who are targeted on social media. You know, for example, there's members in our group who are being targeted on social media, being called out, being you know, being being reported to the to to campus um, authorities, like being asked for them to resign from their student leadership positions. So I was wondering because, if you had any uh, because of their po their positions. Yeah, because, because of, of their support of. Positions. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, if there's any any advice you had to like, you know, for our group or you know these students in, in dealing with this. Well, I mean, I think I mean I think this is the kind of thing that we have to organize. I, I just want to say here, the thing about Scholar Strike Canada and what I think that we are hoping to do is that it, this is not institutional, right? This is a space to give voice, right? To um, scholars but to, and to students and to activists um, to actually um, say the things that they often are not allowed to say or feel threatened when they say it. In, 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 you know, um, within the context of the institution, right? And, um, and I think one of the things that, you know, um, we, we do, um, or the idea of Scholar Strike does, is to actually provide uh, a, a kind of a, 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 a place holding for people to be able to take up that space and say, this is what is happening. And this is what needs to be um, articulated here that is happening within the institution and that is happening to us and that we are being penalized, you know, in situations where um, we are speaking out on, on certain things that, um, you know, that, that uh, this, the institution may not hold as, as practice or, or, you know, ideologically may not support. Right. So, I mean, I am hoping that we could also make space for student voices as part of Scholar Strike because they too are up and coming scholars. They are right. They are being prepared to be there within a, a scholarly institution. So they I'm hoping that we can find space for them. And we this time we did in terms of many of them are working with us and, you know, it, uh, we're part of the planning of Scholar Strike Canada. Right. And making space for them so that there is a space where they can actually have to speak about some of this.
And I think we also need to be organizing, you know, um, as faculty, as, as students, um, in support, you know, of students who actually are experiencing this kind of backlash, right? I mean, yes, we, we are told that as academics, we have academic freedom, but you know, that is, that, yeah, I mean, we've, we've seen, we're, we've seen what that, we've seen what that means and it doesn't apply to all of us in the same way. Right. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm in medicine and it's, I can tell you it's, it's a, uh, there's no academic freedom right now it's in the faculty of medicine. Exactly. <laughs> right. And for students, um, they don't, ne I mean, don't necessarily have um, that kind of safety. So I mean, my, my role, you know, as an, as an educator, and as an educator who's an activist and an organizer, um, I've always been to actually advocate for students, right? And to advocate for, sh for, ch for, for students' safety and protection and their right to speak, right? Politically, right? And their right to articulate their, po their politics. And I think that's what we as academics and, 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 and teachers have to do. We have to, we have to, 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 to be there as the, the individuals who would actually, you know, um, try to create that space for our students so that when they get on platforms and when, um, um, uh, you know, um, complaints are carried to um, ac um, administrators that we are there to advocate on their behalf, that this is actually unacceptable. That's that a student should find themselves not able to be part of the community because you know of their their politics and usually it's their left politics we know that gets attacked right it's their politics around mm -hmm. sexuality mm -hmm. their politics around um, being trans their politics around race their politics around Palestine we know how much punitive uh, measures and attacks that many academics and graduate students and students have had for BDS. We know that the university right now is withholding money, mm -hmm. right, from the graduate students union um, that is supposed to go to the BDS um, committee, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that um, um, we know that academic freedom and the right of students to voice their um, political positions is really dependent on you know, one that is actually um, um, shaped by a particular kind of neoliberal uh, um, white, you know, um, you know, um, uh, conservative ultra right ideology. And if students, um, you know, take on a, 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 you know, a politic that is left, um, it, they're seen as actually undermining, you know, students who feel that that space um, that they, they should be able to retain a certain kind of comfort in their, you know, in their own um, conservatism and not have that challenge, right? Mm -hmm. I just want to be mindful of time here. I know it's seven thirty. I was wondering if you had time for one more question, or if you had to. Well, we have one more minute, so I'm, it's best to wrap up, I guess. Eh? Okay, I guess maybe like a quick answer. I think one thing we wanted to kind of get out of this was, was imagining a police-free future. So maybe just asking, like, what does a police-free U of T mean to you? Um, Really been well. A police-free, um, a, a police-free university means that there's no campus police. I mean, that's. I mean, you know, we do not need campus police. Um, you know, um, a, a free, uh, um, a, a police, a free, uh, a, a police-free university means that it's an environment where students uh, can actually secure, um, uh, find, and access mutual care and mutual support, right? Where we form teams to actually support students who need support, let's say, you know, um, uh, are feeling unsafe at certain times on campuses. We can create those teams ourselves amongst our citizens or amongst our constituents within the institution to provide that kind of support to students, right? I think um, there is also this sense that um, we can only um, be safe if someone is wearing a uniform mm -hmm. that says they are there uh, to intervene on our behalf. 
Um, and that is uh, and that has proven not useful to any of us and anywhere in the world, actually, for the majority of us. Right. In fact, if anything, it is it is it is proven dangerous. So I think a, um, a police free U of T is first and foremost, campus police be removed from uh, um, the institution that the, that we create um, mutual care teams. Um, we actually engage with communities who are already doing mutual care and mutual support, right? To provide that support to students on campus who would work with our wellness teams, right? And who would be called in situations where students um, need additional support to that which is offered by wellness, the wellness center, right? Yeah, well, thank you so much for, for that incredible, like, you know, sharing of information and sharing your experiences and stories and, and your knowledge with us today. I really much appreciate it. And for those who are listening, if you're interested in joining, you know, our Police Free UFT Coalition and, and working on everything that, you know, Beverly just mentioned from, you know, community-led responses, trying to get to the South Campus, you know, get rid of, getting rid of, um, you know, discriminatory and, and, you know, ableist policies, such as UMLAP as, as the UFT Law Union is doing. Um, you know, feel free to email us at Toronto at tssdp.org. Um, we'll share again in the in the chat, um, or you can DM us on Twitter. We're going to continue to organize over the spring and summer with more direct actions and, and more open letters in the source. So, you know, please join us in our coalition. Um, I want to again thank everybody if you have any last words or- we Thank you, Hush. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was a pleasure chatting with you and, and a pleasure um, um, answering the questions. And thank you for all who join in on the chat. Much, much appreciation yep. in solidarity. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a good night. And uh, please be sure to check out the other teachings that Scholarship Canada is putting on tomorrow and showing up in person on the day of action. Um, if you could just tell us where it's starting so people can, I think it's at the uh, former so statue. At Gould in front of X University, formerly Ryerson. Uh, that's where we are gathering. And from there, we will be walking. We are not um, advertising our route, um, which is why we're gonna gather there. And then we will be um, shepherded uh, um, through a route that will bring us right back to the University of Toronto, where we will have um, some, uh, a few speeches there. And along the route, we are having um, people speak a diff um, that marks different sites where certain um, uprisings and, and certain um, resistance happen, um, took place by indigenous people, black and racialized people. Thank you, yeah, so please be sure to come. Sorry, what time was it? What time was that on Wednesday? Uh, we gather at noon. At noon, okay. Room. Okay, yeah, so please make sure to come at noon um, to be involved in that um, walking tour. I think it'll be really important and, and vital for us to move as we move forward in this movement. Um, yeah, this was hopefully the first, this is going to be the first of many steps moving forward in actions to organize and mobilize students to develop a safer police-free UFT campus. Um, thank you, everyone. Again.